In this video, we're going to explain how to conduct and interpret an analysis of variance, or ANOVA. You'll learn how to navigate the output of an ANOVA and find what you need to draw conclusions from the results. Before we start, let's review what an ANOVA is and what it's used for. An ANOVA is basically a test for differences in group means. Let me illustrate this with an example. Say you work for the State Board of Education and you'd like to know whether three schools in your state are producing similar test scores. You'd start by collecting some data from each of the three schools. Each data point would represent a student's test score. If you collect enough from each school, you'll have an estimate of that school's average test score as well as the variability of test scores within that school. Let's get started. First, it's important that you set your data up correctly. To conduct an ANOVA, you need one scale level variable and one nominal level variable. In our example, school is a nominal level variable and test scores is a scale level variable. Your data should look like this. Now let's conduct the ANOVA. The main objective of an ANOVA is to look at overall variability in some data and try to determine whether a majority of the variability can be attributed to the differences between groups, or if all the variability is within the groups. This information can help inform us as to whether the means are all the same or if they're far enough apart for us to pay attention. In this example, we're testing the null hypothesis or default hypothesis that each school's test scores are equal. Here are the interpreted ANOVA results. Let's start with the raw output to see how we got here. At its most basic, the output of an ANOVA will consist of a single table, but it's common to see additional tables or plots. In this case, you can see there's a table for descriptive statistics reporting the means and standard deviations of the groups and a table for post hoc comparisons. For now, let's focus on the ANOVA table. The main ANOVA table contains information on the variance of the data and the sample size, as well as the results of the statistical hypothesis test. All the information in this table is useful for understanding the analysis at a deeper level, but at an initial glance, all you need to look at are these last two columns. The column labeled P is the probability value, or p-value. This number can be used to decide whether we call the result significant or not. This will always be a number between 0 and 1 and represents the likelihood of observing the result under the null hypothesis. In this example, p is less than 0 .001. This means, if we assume that there really is no difference in the student's test scores, there's less than a 1 in 1,000 chance that we would see a difference like this. It's still a possibility that these differences are just due to random chance, but it's very unlikely. That means we can say the result is statistically significant. Next, we need to look at the column labeled eta squared. This is called an effect size statistic. Effect sizes help put the result into context. P-values are a function of sample size, so if we're dealing with a very large sample size, say in the thousands or millions, even a very tiny difference would be statistically significant. In the real world, we probably don't care about these tiny differences, so effect size statistics give us a way to decide how we want to interpret the result. Like the p-value, eta squared is also a number between 0 and 1, but it's not a probability. Instead, eta squared measures the proportion of variance accounted for by the independent variables. That also means that higher is better. In this case, the eta squared is really high. It tells us that over 70% of the variance in test scores is explainable by the school the students attend. This reinforces the statistical significance. Okay, we're almost done. The last thing we need to do is look at the plots I mentioned earlier to see if the assumptions were met. We'll switch over to the document view to look at the assumptions. Most of statistics isn't perfect. There are many things that are only approximations or that only work under certain conditions, and the ANOVA is no different. For one, it only works when the process to produce the data is normally distributed with equal variance across groups. The data also have to be independent. These are called assumptions because we assume these conditions are true when performing the calculations. That means that all the results we calculated only apply if those conditions really are true. We have to look at some special values called the residuals to decide whether the assumptions are met or not. Let's look at the normality assumption first. There are many methods for this, but probably the most common is to just assess the assumption visually. This is called a normal quantile quantile or QQ plot. This plot compares our residuals with a normal distribution. What we want here is for the points to follow the line. There will always be some deviations, but as long as they're small and there's no pattern or curvature, we can say the normality assumption is met. Here you can see examples of normal and non-normal distributions. In this case, the sample size is small, so there are a few deviations, but they appear to follow the line well enough, so we'll say the normality assumption is met. The next plot uses the same residuals as the QQ plot, but plots them against the group means on the x-axis. 
What we want here is to see each set of points centered at zero and to have about the same variance. That means each set of these points should look about the same with similar minimum and maximum. It looks like that's the case here, so the equal variance assumption is also met. Sometimes it can be hard to identify outliers using the QQ plot alone, so an additional plot called the Sudanize residual plot can be used. Any points which are above the line indicate observations which could be designated outliers. The most critical assumption is that the data need to be sampled randomly and independently. This usually can't be tested, so when collecting data, keep this assumption in mind. So how do we connect all of these numbers to our actual data? What does this result say about our three schools and their students' test scores? Let's scroll down to our ANOVA results and review what we learned so far. We know that the result of our ANOVA is unlikely under the null hypothesis indicated by the small p-value. We also know that our model is specified pretty well, possibly explaining around 70% of the variance in test scores. Finally, our assumptions were not strongly violated, so we know we can rely on these results. Based on all of this, we can conclude that at least one of these three schools are producing test scores that are significantly different from the others. If we look at the descriptive statistics table, we can see that school C had the highest average scores, followed by school B, with school A having the lowest scores. If we wanted, we could follow up this ANOVA with some additional tests to explore the differences between each pair of schools. And that's it! That's all you need to know to understand the basics of ANOVA output. Remember to always check the assumptions no matter what analysis you're conducting, and make sure the result is actually meaningful, even if you have a small p-value. If you have additional questions, feel free to join us for our free statistical consulting sessions. Simply click the resources button to register.